I've been involved in um, wine microbiology for, uh, for, for more than 20 years. Uh, started in South Africa, uh, studied wine microbiology in Stellenbosch. And after that, I moved to Australia, uh, worked at the Australian Wine Research Institute, uh, researching on uh, yeast and uh, wine flavor. And the topic I'm uh, speaking about today has always been a great interest uh, for me. So I was very happy uh, to join Christine Hansen when uh, they've just launched uh, this concept from a commercial point of view. Uh, Non-saccharomyces yeast have been a subject of interest for wine scientists for uh, more than 70 years. And today, uh, it's even more. Um, and the truth is that non-saccharomyces yeast have had a significant impact on uh, wine quality and flavor for thousands of years. And it's only uh, recently that that impact has been greatly diminished. Uh, and how did that happen? Uh, that happened when we started inoculating Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, and that in itself has been a great advance for the wine industry. Uh, cleaner ferments, less stuck alcoholic. Uh, but the consequence of that practice is that uh, non-saccharomyces yeast have less of an uh, impact on the wine quality and flavor. So what is that all about? This is a slide from a publication um, from one of our collaborators, Matthew Goddard from New Zealand. And he's an ecologist. He's particularly interested in the ecology of uh, wine ferments, vineyards. And what you see here is a representation of a spontaneous wine ferment in four uh, barrels of Chardonnay. And you have the, the cell count there and the ethanol formation, the temperature over there. The solid lines are Saccharomyces yeast. And the dotted lines are non-saccharomyces yeast. And each line represents uh, one barrel. So the first thing you will notice uh, is, of course, it takes a very long time for the saccharomyces yeast to start uh, the alcoholic fermentation. But before the alcoholic fermentation starts, you have this spike of non-saccharomyces yeast. Um, and the diversity in this area is absolutely enormous. And maybe you've seen that in the pre previous presentation or uh, uh, you had before. But um, it's just incredible how diverse uh, the yeast are here compared to the alcoholic fermentation, which is normally uh, only the Saccharomyces yeast. So what happens if you inoculate Saccharomyces yeast? Uh, you start here with a very high concentration of Saccharomyces yeast. And then you never give these guys a chance to have any effect. But very importantly, uh, you need to have the right non-Saccharomyces yeast. Of course, not all non-Saccharomyces yeast are good. Bretanomyces is a good example. You have Hansenia spora producing a lot of acetic acid. Uh, so the key is finding the right non-Saccharomyces yeast. And that is exactly what our company set about to do, is find the right yeast and produce the yeast and provide it back to the winemaker. And what we firmly believe is that today we are not getting all the potential out of our grapes through fermentation by only using Saccharomyces. Uh, grapes have a lot of flavor potential. Uh, some come in the form of precursors like terpenoids, volatile thiols. You need the fermentation through a microorganism to release these flavor compounds. Some are inherent in the grapes. They don't really change, but they can be influenced by other flavor compounds. In the following presentation, uh, I will try and demonstrate to you how we can use non-saccharomyces yeast to get more value out of your grapes. So as I said earlier, very important is to find the right yeast. So how do we do that? Uh, first thing we do is we source strains from all over the world. We follow the OIV regulations. So these strains are only derived from grapes 
or fermenting mast or wine. Uh, then we purify the yeast and we, uh, we start screening at our laboratory facilities in Denmark. So we use high throughput screening. So this is what we've done. We are continuing to do that uh, to develop second generation products. And we screen for particular properties that we are interested in. Uh, and of course, what's very important, these yeasts shouldn't produce any off flavors. Uh, they should be compatible with other yeast, other Saccharomyces yeast, and they should be compatible with malolactic bacteria. At least not inhibit the bacteria, preferably stimulate the malolactic fermentation. So once we've found the right yeast, uh, the next step is to try and produce these non-Saccharomyces yeast. And uh, that is not uh, that easy given that they are so, uh, so different. So the first yeast, uh, non-saccharomyces yeast and product I would like to present uh, is the Viniflora fruitsen. So uh, for some of you, this might look very different to uh, what you're used to. Uh, and this is in fact a frozen yeast. And the reason it's frozen is that we were simply not able to produce this yeast uh, in the conventional way we produce wine yeast. And therefore we uh, found a way, and that is by producing frozen yeast. And this says something about non-Saccharomyces yeast. They, they are very different to Saccharomyces yeast. They're a very different animal. If uh, Saccharomyces would be a cow, the non sacs could be a sheep, a uh, giraffe, or elephant, very different. The strain behind uh, Fruitsen is Pichia clavari, so that was actually isolated in New Zealand from a spontaneous fermenting Chardonnay, so this first slide I show you. Um, and it has an amazing capacity for fruit expression. So at least from all the yeast that I've seen uh, in my working life, this yeast has a capacity to produce flavor, which uh, I've never seen with another uh, species of yeast. It generates a lot of esters. It's also very good at releasing volatile thiols, so these fruity flavor compounds. Uh, it was actually isolated as part of a research program by Auckland University um, to find non-saccharomyces yeast that are able to release thiols. And very interestingly, um, it's an oxidative yeast, very oxidative. So, uh, it uh, uses oxygen very fast, uh, much faster than a Saccharomyces yeast. Um, and for those of you who have tried it or maybe will try it, what you'll often see is when you inoculate the yeast a day or two or three later, you will see this film formation uh, on top of the tank. Uh, don't be alarmed. But what the yeast is doing, it's going up searching for oxygen. So it's a very good yeast uh, when you want to do reductive winemaking, uh, for instance, like in Sauvignon Blanc. So it's, it's perfectly suited for uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Just to continue on how different this yeast is, um, if you look at the, the agar plates here, where it was plated, um, this is the Pica Cluveri. And this is Pica Cluveri together with Saccharomyces. So you see, it maybe you don't see it that well, but it's, it's very flat, almost flower-like shape. Uh, maybe it looks a little bit like a fungi. And then uh, this is the normal Saccharomyces yeast, uh, classic colony formation. If you look under the microscope, the Pica clavari is very different. It's sort of long, elongated, almost rod-shaped. Uh, it's also... Um, much smaller than the Saccharomyces, so at least uh, half the size. And uh, this is also one of the reasons why we couldn't produce it in a conventional way. We were just losing the yeast through the filtration steps and the subsequent drying. Um, but very good for us, our company had a, a frozen uh, cultures uh, for many years, so we could tap into that competence, learn from that, 
and be able to uh, provide a yeast uh, in a form that's easy for winemakers to use. Very important to note with this yeast, uh, it's not a strong fermenter at all. It can ferment only to uh, 2 or 3% alcohol. Um, so when you add it to your juice or your grapes, uh, do not expect gas formation, uh, do not expect sugar reduction. Uh, what you will see uh, after a day or two, you will start tasting uh, the juice will be more fruity uh, character. And you will, in some cases, see this film formation. Uh, but it does not ferment like a classic Saccharomyces yeast. I mentioned the, the volatile thiols. So uh, the yeast was isolated uh, for that reason by Auckland University. And this was the first trials we did in New Zealand uh, with the prototype product. And the volatile thiols uh, give you these tropical passion fruit aromas. Uh, they occur in very low concentrations in wine, but they're very, very potent. Uh, only a few nanograms will give you a, a fruity character in your wines. So what we have is uh, volatile thiol concentration over here. Um, and we have the two of the volatile thiols, the 3MH and the 3MHA, important uh, volatile thiols with passion fruit character. Uh, so in the control tank was only Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Now Saccharomyces cerevisiae can also release the thiols from the precursor, and some are better than others. Uh, and this was uh, one of the best Saccharomyces yeast to release thiols in, uh, in wine. And the first... Uh, the second barrier is showing where we inoculated the Picea cluveri together with the Saccharomyces yeast in the Sauvignon Blanc. And the analysis of the wine indicated an increase in both 3MH and 3MHA. When we inoculated the Picea uh, cluveri uh, in the wine and waited 48 hours before we added the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, we got an even bigger increase. So we call that a sequential inoculation. And this is a very important point to understand with non-saccharomyces yeast. Um, because they're not strong fermenters, because the saccharomyces will always take over, the more time you give the non-saccharomyces yeast, the bigger the effect. You will get an effect if you inoculate it together with the saccharomyces, uh, but you'll get a bigger effect if you give it more time on the juice or the grapes. And you can do that uh, by spreading the time between inoculations. Some uh, practical aspects uh, in using this yeast. As I said, it's uh, minus 50, very cold. But when you take it out of the freezer, uh, use gloves, please. Um, put it in some lukewarm water just to make the outside of the, the packet thaw, make it easier to handle. Uh, and then very carefully uh, cut it open with a knife or scissors. And you can then directly add it to your grape juice or your grapes. It's already hydrated, so it hasn't been dehydrated in the process. So you can just add it directly to the, to the grape juice. Now, over the, the years, uh, as you've seen in the previous slide, some, some time has passed since we introduced this product. Uh, a lot of clients in the world, and in the world have been uh, playing around with inoculating or inoculation time is. Um, so we have clients now that even <coughs> inoculate the Pikia or the Fruitsen uh, on the harvest trucks. So they basically pour the yeast, mix it with water and spray it on the harvest trucks. And the thinking behind that is to get the Pikia or the Fruitsen onto your grapes as soon as possible. Uh, it bioprotects, it helps to scavenge oxygen and it already starts extracting some of these precursors uh, from the grapes. It won't run away with the fermentation. As I said, it's a very slow, uh, slow, slow fermenter, so you don't have to worry about starting fermenting the grapes uh, on, on, on the harvest trucks. Then uh, some of our clients uh, use it already in, before cold settling to get it into the wine as soon as possible. 
let it embed in the, in the grape juice. Uh, and at very cold temperatures, it's not going to do much like any other microorganism. Uh, there won't be much activity. It won't die. I mean, it's, it's coming out of minus 50, so it won't die. It will, it will be there as the temperature goes up, and then it will start being active and working on the juice, uh, releasing the thiols. For the red seeds, uh, currently mostly used uh, during the tank fillings. So the recommendation is to, uh, to inoculate the pikia or fruitsen as soon as possible. Get it on the grapes, bioprotect, protect your flavors. Just to give some of examples on the, the flavor profile, we always get more fruity wines with uh, fruitsen. So this was an example from uh, France. Uh, in the Loire Valley. Um, so uh, you will see with the fruits and in blue, uh, we get much increased tropical fruit aromas. We get passion fruit, mango, pineapple, and some floral tones. So that was the start of fruits and Sauvignon Blanc. But later on, we started exploring other varieties. Um, and particular Pinot Noir. So this was a trial we did in Chile. Um, and you can see when we used the fruits in, the volatile thiols increased. The concentration of volatile thiols are much, much lower in, in Pinot Noir and a lot of other varieties compared to Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc has one of the highest concentrations of volatile thiols, but either way, they are there. And they do have an impact because that's, as you can see, the perception threshold, it's very low. Uh, but what's interesting about the volatile thiols in uh, red wines uh, is that they don't give a passion fruit character. They actually give a very particular black currant uh, aroma. So if you do have black currant aroma in your wine, uh, then most likely a lot of that is coming from a volatile thiol and not an ester. So what are we using? Uh, Viniflora fruits and four, uh, in what applications? Uh, mostly white, it started out on the white. Uh, it's used a lot on rosé now, uh, especially in France. Uh, in particular, uh, we have producers there wanting to produce uh, rosés without any added sulfur. So they would like to have a rosé with a label stating no added sulfur. So if you can't add sulfur, of course, then you have to struggle with wild microorganisms and with oxidation. So this is where the, the fruits can come in very handy. Uh, you inoculate it very early on. It protects the grapes. It scavenges oxygen. And you get a better product at the end that's more fruity. Um, then, uh, especially in Australia, um, in uh, the Griffith area, middle of the desert, it's very hot. Uh, they have uh, white grapes, mostly Chardonnay, very high yield, very low uh, flavor potential in many cases. Uh, and there, uh, the winemakers are using uh, fruits and to, to give some flavor boost to these uh, grapes that have very low potential, and that's working pretty well. Um, and then I mentioned the Pinot Noir uh, and to the black currant aromas and the overall fruit boost that you find with uh, fruits and in, in, in uh, Pinot Noir. Would yes, you, go for it. On the, um, so the application of this, if you were going to do a skin contact white fermentation, putting that I'll just put it back. right at the start, is that going to greatly reduce your orange wine capacity? Uh, the orange wine? Do you think it will? No, I, I was asking. No, no, no. Yeah, I, 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 I forgot to mention the, the skin contact. So you obviously doing skin contact on white wines? Is that... uh, I've been around it. Yeah, and okay. It produces orange. It yeah. produces orange wine. Ah, okay. So when it yeah. reduce that amount of yeah. oxidative color? Yeah, yeah, sure. Would. Yeah, so... Uh, could you, could you, you, by doing that application and then going into another, another yeast, could you do a skin contact white and still retain that white clarity? That is our experience, um, and where they do that is in, uh, in Sancerre, in France. Uh, 
Um, so about three years ago, we started experimenting. And the reason they do skin contact is to get more uh, of the precursors from the Sauvignon Blanc to get more of the varietal. But then, of course, always the danger is the, the oxidation. Um, so at least in that area, uh, it seemed to work very well, and they don't have any issues with the, the color. We initially did, did with Trusso Green, and it came out quite orange. Okay. Um, All our work has been on Sauvignon Blanc with that, yeah. Um, any other questions? Or feel free to interrupt me during the presentation. So that brings me to the, the next uh, non-saccharomyces yeast I would like to discuss. Um, it's a Clivermyces thermotolerance. Now, um, the microbiologists have recently changed the name to La Chancia thermotolerance. Uh, it's sort of confusing, but that's the way it works in uh, microbiology. Uh, and actually, 50 years ago, it was called Saccharomyces as a genus, not Cerevisiae, but at least Saccharomyces as a genus, uh, meaning that it's also reasonably close to, uh, to Saccharomyces. Uh, what's very interesting about this yeast is that it produces lactic acid so from sugars. So there are not many yeast that can actually produce lactic acid from sugars, and this particular genus and species can do that. Um, and therefore, it improves the the acid balance of the wine, brings some acidity to the wine. Uh, and what we have seen over the years is uh, it creates these red berry aromas, and we've identified some flavor compounds that explain these uh, red berry aromas. Um, and what's interesting about this uh, genus and species of yeast, it was actually uh, promoted and used in Australia in the 1950s. Uh, it was sent out by the Australian Wine Research Institute when we, they were only three people. Uh, two winemakers on a slant, they propagated the yeast. And uh, the reason for that is they wanted to get some acidity in the high pH, low acid Australian wines. And um, that was the days before they had tartaric acid available. Um, but that, uh, that concept didn't last very long. It was just too complicated for the winemakers to propagate the yeast, etc. Uh, so very happy that uh, Christian Hansen was able to take this yeast and be able to commercialize it and give it to winemakers makers, uh, to uh, enhance their wines. So the red berry aroma, some of the flavor compounds that we've sort of found uh, key to Concerto is these uh, particular esters, ethyl butyrate and ethyl octanoate, um, very boosted in uh, Concerto. These are long chain fatty acid esters. So they're actually more stable. They're less volatile, but more stable uh, than the shorter chain uh, esters. So they, see, they tend to long, uh, last longer in the wine. I mentioned earlier that there's a big interest in uh, non saccharomyces yeast from the scientific community. So uh, this is an illustration from work done by an Italian group. Um, and it shows two interesting uh, points. One is, uh, as expected, when you use the clivermyces, then the titratable acidity goes up compared to the saccharomyces, uh, and then the pH goes down. But another interesting aspect of this experiment they did was um, they co-inoculated with saccharomyces, uh, but then, then they reduced the concentration of Saccharomyces. So they started off with 10 million cells per milliliter, uh, and then they reduced it to 100,000 cells per milliliter, and then to 1,000 cells per milliliter. And then you see the effect increase. So that brings me back to the, my first point earlier on, is the key with non-Saccharomyces yeast is to give it as much time as possible on the juice before the Saccharomyces dominate. Uh, so you can do that with the timing, which we, uh, which we recommend. Uh, and in this case, this group uh, did it by reducing the concentration of Saccharomyces. And therefore, it takes longer for the Saccharomyces to take over. And the non-Saccharomyces yeast has more time 
to work on the juice or the grapes. Um, this is some exploratory work we're doing, uh, or have done, and continue to do, uh, using in particular Concerto. So this was work uh, we did in uh, Valpolicella. Uh, so we have three tanks there. The first one is uh, just uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Then we, in tank two, we had Cleveromyces uh, thermotolerance, the Concerto, together with the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this Saccharomyces cerevisiae was inoculated 48 hours after Concerto. And then we did something interesting. We only inoculated the Concerto. Uh, we increased the dose to compensate for the fact that it's not a strong fermenter. Uh, and then what we saw is uh, the kinetics of the fermentation was quite the same, and they all finished to dryness. Now, what we didn't do, in particular in this case, uh, we only had the concerts. We didn't look at the population of the yeast at the end. And this is something we're busy with. Um, so we, we can't really say if concerto finished the whole ferment. Most likely, a saccharomyces, a wild saccharomyces, would have taken over the ferment and finished it. But either way, it had a very big impact uh, on the flavor and the taste of the wine. And that also showed in the analytics. So we looked at the lactic acid, of course, um, and you'll see that the Saccharomyces doesn't make any lactic acid. When you have the Concerto, uh, both with the Sac and by itself, it, it makes uh, lactic acid. In this case, we found a half a gram uh, per liter, uh, so not that much. Um, but then you also see that at some point, the, the lactic acid formation just stops. And we're trying to understand why that is and trying to understand uh, the parameters that uh, stimulate lactic acid production. Maybe it's oxygen. When the oxygen disappears, the lactic acid stops. But either way, it did produce some lactic acid. Um, so this strain uh, of Cleveromyces uh, is sort of a, a mild strain. Uh, we are working on strains producing much more lactic acid. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, that we'd like to reduce the alcohol concentration in wine. Uh, and one way to do that is to move sugars to lactic acid. Uh, so we, we do have strains that can produce uh, you know, five, six, seven grams per liter. So the interesting part would, see, would be in future to see what they do to the flavor of the wine. Another compound associated with red berry aromas is ether lactate. Uh, sort of gives these strawberry type characters. And that's very simple. Uh, it's an ester made from lactic acid. Uh, so you have ethanol, lactic acid, and then during the alcoholic fermentation, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast can create this ester called ether lactate. Uh, so you can produce that with the Cleveromyces, but you also get it if you have, for some reason, lactic acid uh, in your juice or grapes, maybe a spontaneous malolactics happening there, uh, or if you do a co-inoculation, if you to bacteria and yeast together, the bacteria will make lactic acid and the yeast will turn it into ether lactate. So you, you will always get higher ether lactate concentration. And this is just to illustrate that when we use the concerto, we always get higher ether lactate concentrations compared to other yeast. So uh, concerto is used for uh, Increased the city, warm climate wines, gives these red berry aromas. And we've also recently seen that it's very good at bioprotection. It actually is able to inhibit some bad non saccharomyces yeast. So that's a very exciting discovery and great application for this yeast. So what are we using it for? Uh, mostly red, um, but some producers are working with it on sparkling wine. Mm, sparkling base wine, of course, the sugars are not that high. And um, the Cleveromyces can ferment up to 11, 12% alcohol. So that works out quite well. Uh, so in some cases, they don't even add the Saccharomyces. Um, what I've seen on the white wines for the Cleveromyces is uh, it creates this minerality, almost like chalkiness. Uh, it could be due to the lactic acid 
Um, but uh, that type of uh, flavor profile is uh, suited for some sparkling wines. Uh, I mentioned the, the warm climate rates. Uh, then we've seen in France where they do a lot of thermovinification. So if you do thermovinification, you heat up the grapes, you get this really cooked sensory profile. And the uh, concerto seems to work really well in uh, compensating and overcoming that type of flavor profile. Uh, and then if you do use it on the whites, uh, you can, of course, then use it as a blending component. And I mentioned the bioprotection. So that brings me to the third non-saccharomyces yeast. So this is a Torilla spora del Bruchier. Um, and it was also about 50 years ago called Saccharomyces del Bruchier. So that name has also changed. So it's also more closer to the Saccharomyces. Uh, it's also a reasonably strong fermenter for a non-sac. Of course, not as strong as a Saccharomyces, but for a non-sac, actually ferments quite well. Um, the main feature there is that it improves mouthfeel. So when you use this yeast, you get this fuller body, a heavier wine, more texture. Uh, and the reason for that is that it produces uh, polysaccharides or manoproteins. <clears throat> now, uh, all yeast produce polysaccharides or manoproteins, including the saccharomyces. Uh, but in general, the non-saccharomyces yeast produce more uh, polysaccharides. So Actually, with all our non-saccharomyces yeast, you will notice uh, improved uh, mouthfeel. Uh, but from all the non-saccharomyces yeast, the Torilla Spora del Bruchi is the best uh, from what we've seen. And also, the, the literature is telling us at producing these, uh, these manoproteins. Then on the flavor side, uh, what we have noticed, um, it tends to uh, be on a dark fruit spectrum, what we call it. So uh, more the plums uh, the, uh, type characters. And then we sometimes get this candy flavor, which is, uh, which is quite interesting. And then another interesting feature of this yeast, uh, it produces very low uh, VA. And I'll explain why in further down the presentation. <clears throat> so I mentioned the polysaccharide production, which gives you this texture and uh, viscosity, the mouthfeel. Um, and Torilla spora yeast is different to other yeast in that the fact that it's very osmo tolerant. Uh, and that explains the VA effect. Uh, if you have a Saccharomyces yeast on a high sugar must, it gets stressed and starts producing uh, a lot of acetic acid. So, for instance, on your noble rot, uh, botrytized sweet wines, you can get a lot of acetic acid. Um, the Torilla spora. So Bruchia is much more osmotolerant, so it does produce VA, but not nearly as much as the Saccharomyces under those conditions. So back to the literature. Um, same group in Italy, working a lot on non-Saccharomyces cerevisiae. They did a similar experiment, as I showed in the concerto. Uh, so you have the Saccharomyces uh, yeast there, you have polysaccharides, and then when you add the Torilla spora del Bruchi, you get increase in polysaccharides. And then as they reduce the concentration of the saccharomyces, they get even more uh, polysaccharides. So again, illustrating that if you give the non-sac more time on the grapes, on the juice, the effect will be bigger. But if you do it together with the saccharomyces, even in high dose, you will still have an effect, but less of an effect. Uh, just to illustrate the flavor profiles of one, one example, at least, of the, the flavor profile. This was a Merlot from Saint Emilion Saint in France. Uh, we get these dark fruit, plummy characters compared to sort of more spicy uh, character and harsh alcoholic for the spontaneous. Then we had an interesting uh, case in, uh, in fact, in South Africa. There was um, is a winemaker that was struggling with green flavors in his Merlot. Um, and green flavors in wines uh, is generally related to methoxypyrazines. So with the methoxypyrazines you can manage in the vineyard. Once you have it in your cellar, you can't really get rid of it. It's a very stable compound. Uh, so the approach was not to uh, degrade the methoxypyrazine, and that would be nice, but as far as we know, there's no microorganism able to do that. Uh, but to mask the flavor. 
uh, of the, the green character. So we used the prelude for that. Um, and the outcome was actually very good. The, the wines with the prelude, the Torilla Spora, had much less of a green character, had more fruit. Uh, so obviously, if you're creating more fruit flavors, you see the green less. Um, I also think, due to the production of the manor proteins, um, you tend to encapsulate bigger, uh, bigger flavor molecules to make them less volatile. Uh, so that's also uh, a likely reason why uh, they could see the green characters much less. I mentioned the VA. So this is an example of uh, work we did in saint Emilion, where they make these noble rot sweet wines. And in that experiment, we could reduce the acetic acid by 50% compared to using Saccharomyces cerevisiae alone. So what do we use Prelude for? Um, mostly reds. Um, there's also a lot of application in cold soak reds, especially in Bordeaux. Uh, as I said earlier, you can inoculate the yeast in very cold temperatures. It's not going to do much at that temperature, but it's going to start and embed itself and get used to the environment. As the temperature goes up, uh, it will uh, start being more active. In uh, Australia and New Zealand, they're starting to use it more and more on the whites, um, and that is to create more fatter, full-bodied uh, wines with a better mouthfeel. And this is a summary of the three non-sacs that I just described uh, in a trial we did in Spain, a summary on the flavor profile that they create. So we had the fruits and the prelude and concerto in a Cabernet Sauvignon. And as expected, the fruits and resulted in the highest fruitiness. The prelude gave the most body. The concerto gave the strawberry and acidity. And when we trialed this yeast on a rosé made from bobal, bobal is a Spanish variety, we had increase in fruitiness with fruits and increase in body with prelude, black plum, and then concerto, uh, acidity, and strawberry. I talked a lot about timing. So this is, this is just to summarize. So we recommend sequential inoculation between one and three days. That is depending on the, the wine, the grapes. Uh, if you're getting in red grapes with very high temperatures, with a lot of indigenous flora, of course, you're not going to wait three days. You'll wait one day. Uh, if you're getting very clean grapes, white wine, cooler temperatures, uh, then you can wait up to three days before you add your Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Just some uh, important practical information on uh, using the non-saccharomyces yeast, at least the active dried ones, the two active dried non-saccharomyces yeast. Uh, the rehydration temperature is lower than for saccharomyces yeast. Uh, they tend to be more sensitive to higher temperatures. So it's better to rehydrate them at lower temperatures. Uh, and of course, like all, all other active dried yeast, use unchlorinated water and unsulfured must. So be aware of the slight differences uh, between these yeast. This brings me to the final non-saccharomyces yeast uh, product we have. So this is one of the original ones. Uh, it's a blend. So for winemakers who do not want to add complexity to the process where they have to add a non-sac and then a saccharomyces, uh, this is a good product for you. It has uh, two non-saccharomyces yeast. 20% Torilla Spora and 20% La Sancia, and 60% uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, our own Saccharomyces cerevisiae called Merit, a very strong fermenter. And that sort of gives you the best uh, of both worlds. Um, originally, the melody was used a lot uh, for Chardonnay. Uh, there was a study by the Australian Wine Research Institute many years ago indicating that Melody was one of the best yeast for Chardonnay, created a lot of uh, mouthfeel, a fuller wine, a lot of flavor complexity. Um, but recently, especially in Australia, uh, it's become actually quite popular in the Barossa Valley, uh, where it's used on Shiraz. Uh, and we have a particular interesting comment from uh, Ginny Leonard. Uh, yeah, saying the Barossa grapes have so much fruit intensity due to the warm climate 
Melody builds the structure to match the fruit. Uh, he's also started using on uh, Grenache and getting what he describes as strawberry ice cream, so that candy type character which you often see with a with a prelude uh, he, he noticed there. Um, so he's actually converted from spontaneous alcoholic to, to using melody because he gets the same sort of uh, complexity but he has much less problems now with stuck alcoholic ferments. So to summarize, uh, we have prelude, increases mouthfeel, concerto, acid balance, fruits in for the fruit expression. The merit is our Saccharomyces yeast, very strong fermenter. The melody is the combination of uh, prelude and concerto uh, together with the Saccharomyces yeast um, to give you a tool to create uh, spontaneous flavors without the risk. Thanks for your attention. Do you have any questions? Um, I would say uh, yes for the yeast. Uh, we, we're trying to expand that concept to other yeast. We have, of course, we have it for the bacteria. Uh, they all direct inoculation. Uh, but we do believe that is uh, something that would uh, make uh, life easier for winemakers um, to have direct inoculation yeast. Are any of you using uh, non-saccharomyces yeast? Or have you tried it before? Yeah, we did a trial of the uh, Melody. Okay. All right. And on which uh, variety? Uh, Chardonnay. Okay. We're, we're a custom crush. We have a lot of clients that are doing doing it. So it started two or three years ago. All right. We started seeing it. Okay. Double inoculations. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's exciting. It's really, uh, it's really developing fast. They seem to really like it. There's a couple of Sauvignon Blanc producers at our facility who are 100%. That's what they're doing. And I, they're using this product. Oh, that's fantastic. Great. So, thank you very much. <laughs>